Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, Brooklyn Magazine is in the house, a local racial and economic equality organization, and our new Brick Gallery exhibit looks at Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Hi, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Ashley Ford. At 10 a.m. on Wednesday morning, anywhere there was a middle school or high school in Brooklyn, the sidewalks and streets spilled over with students honoring the memories of the 17 who were murdered at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, a month ago. They called for leaders to act on passing gun control legislation that would keep guns out of schools. Our producer, Ariana Rosa, spoke to a couple of them at Brooklyn Tech in Fort Greene. Enough is enough. Enough. My name is Sophia enough. Michelle. I'm a senior at Brooklyn Tech. I'm out here because we have lost too many lives. Guns should not be in schools, and I don't understand why Congress hasn't done anything about this. And we're sick and tired of it. My name is Karen, and I'm a senior at Brooklyn Tech. I want to show solidarity to all those who have died in these mass shootings. And we're trying to tell our government to do something. My name's Lydia Stanford. I'm 17. I'm a senior at Brooklyn Technical High School. The goal is to show people who have the power to make a change that the youth are out here. We can't vote, most of us, yet, but this is our way of making a statement and trying to make a change. Enough is enough! Enough is enough! Enough is enough! enough, is enough. But it wasn't just high schoolers. We spoke to a middle schooler from Bed-Stuy yesterday who helped organize the walkout at her school, Unity Prep. A couple other Brooklyn middle schoolers called in to WNYC during their walkout with their own calls for action, even expressing a desire to vote. At 13, I remember being 13. You feel a little bit helpless, you're smart enough to know something's wrong, but you can't make your voice heard at the ballot and elect leaders who reflect your views. This is a time when kids are making decisions that will affect the rest of their lives, and they're engaging with this cause, not just because of guns. I believe if they felt there were people in office who cared more about these kids' futures than their own bank accounts, they wouldn't be organizing like this. Some feel like it's a matter of survival. It might be. But what's most inspiring about this moment, for me, is that these students are not only making their voices heard, they're also speaking up for those whose voices were stolen. More than the will to survive, that implies compassion, which is something we desperately need more of. On the show today, we've got the editor-in-chief of Brooklyn Magazine with us to talk about their beat, Brooklyn. Then, a Brooklyn organization will talk about the ongoing struggle for racial and economic justice. And Brick's got a new exhibit, this one featuring art from Haiti and the DR. But first, two months after Jared Kushner joined his father-in-law at the White House, his family business sold a stake in a Brooklyn property at 175 Pearl Street to a Japanese company that's partially owned by the Japanese government. It was sold at a 60% premium over what Kushner's company paid per square foot four years ago. This investment enabled them to take large ownership stakes in other properties in Dumbo. There's long been concern over the connection between Kushner's business and his presence in the White House, concern enough for his security clearance to be downgraded and for there to be reports by intelligence agencies that other countries viewed him as a potential dupe, partially because of these business entanglements. Everyone involved in the Pearl Street transaction says politics was not behind the sale to the Japanese. But Kushner was helping his father-in-law with trade deals at the time. And this is the kind of thing that conflict of interest rules, which the Trumps like to ignore, seeks to avoid. The possibility that a favor may one day be returned. By the way, the building is sitting vacant. A lawyer walked into a Brooklyn courtroom on Tuesday. Unremarkable? Well, in fact, the man was in custody and being indicted for scamming inmates and their families, telling them that for a fee, he would get their sentences reduced. The accused, Kenneth Moore, is from Queens, but operates out of a Bushwick office. Unfortunately, he operates without a legal degree and allegedly never filed the motions he promised he would, but instead just pocketed the money from desperate and anguished families. Assuming he's sent to prison, I wonder if he'll encounter any of his former clients. Karma's a b Wait! 
That's what the city's Department of Environmental Protection wants some residents of Queens and Brooklyn to do when considering using water during heavy rainstorms. Wait to take a shower, wash the dishes, do the laundry, or flush the toilet. That's because rainwater runoff and city sewage pipes are connected. So during powerful rains, if the system is overburdened, the mix can go into our waterways. To learn more about the initiative and the targeted neighborhoods, go to the DEP website. Spoiler alert, brick falls just outside of the zone. PU turns to phew. Now stay tuned for our first guest. <laughs> Brooklyn Magazine is a quarterly publication dedicated to covering the arts, fashion, and culture in the borough. It's been around for seven years. Their current editor-in-chief has been in his post for less than a year. But we've invited him on the show today because his beat is our beat, because he's my friend, and because we want to hear what's on his radar for this coming spring. Yaran Israel, thank you so much for joining us on what I hope will be the first of many visits to 112BK. Oh, thank you for having me. That was so professional. I felt like I was, I was like, damn, that <laughs> turned it right on. Am I allowed to say damn? I'm going to stop talking. You are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to have you. I was so excited when I heard that you were going to be the new editor-in-chief of Brooklyn Magazine and also the editorial director of yeah. Northside Media. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the magazine? What's so, your beat? So the magazine is, as you, you I think you, you summed it up well, but it's a quarterly magazine. Um, that's dedicated to the, to the culture of like what makes Brooklyn the borough that it is, and what it makes what makes it the cultural epicenter. Um, when I got hired uh, in October of 2017, last year, I had got brought on to the magazine simply because like I was somebody of the borough, grew up here, Bed Stuy, um, and I understood that. Um, the story of Brooklyn is not the story of celebrity. It's not like mm -hmm. one story. It's not just a cultural story. It's like the way you tell the story is, to, is by documenting the people who live here. Yes. And so, like, really under the helm of my vision, Brooklyn Magazine is about, like, how do we make sure that the borough in the magazine, the stories we tell is representative of the people who live mm -hmm. here. So we just, since I came here, it's like, how do we just tell the everyday story? Right. And elevate that story with fun things. So, like, some of the, the things we've been doing is one of my... Um, best things we did was like the 30 and the 30 that we usually yes. do every year, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was on the year, I was on the list last, uh, the year before last, so 2016. Mm -hmm. and I one think we the, were on the same year. No, we wasn't. We were? No, you were on the 100 and then you were on the 30 and the 30, another, another, we wasn't, we Maybe. wasn't. Wish we were. Okay. But <laughs> to, the, to that point, what had happened was there was a shoot at Coney Island and one of the regrettable things about that experience is I didn't get to meet anyone else on the list. Mm. So when the list went up, it's all these people that are doing cool things, and you're like, oh, man, I wish I would have known them. Right. So when I came on to the, um, to the magazine, I was like, the first thing I wanted to do, one, was create this sense that everyone on the list sort of got a sense of who was on the list and, and meet them. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to do was include Brooklyn in that process. I felt like um, looking at it, uh, those lists were so curated from the inside, mm -hmm. but it's like if we're Brooklyn Magazine, I feel like the whole purpose of this magazine is to be of service to the borough. Right. So what we immediately did, um, I did like a, this Instagram video on the page where I was like, um, it was open nominations right. from people of the borough, and to nominate someone for the 30 to 30, you had to have a Brooklyn zip code. So it was wow. this way to let the borough know that they were in direct, you know, hand in who was on this list. And then what we also wow. did, because looking at the list from last year. It was mostly cultural pe people in the culture and the arts. Mm -hmm. So as an editor, you know, and editors is all about the vision. Like right. what statement are we really making with the start type of stories we're following and mm -hmm. the type of stories we're documenting. If I say that this 30 under 30 is like basically who you should be looking out for in Brooklyn and then all of those people are in the arts, am I saying that the gener only thing that you should watch out for from Brooklyn is the arts? Yeah. And for me, I was like, no. So it's like, mm -hmm. how do we make sure we're expanding this to politics? How do we make sure we're expanding it to like the health professions, the legal professions. Right. So it was a wider swath of people we had on the list. So we had like immigration lawyers on there. We had food justice activists. I feel like that's a change that's made by somebody who interacts with the borough in a way that a lot of people, transplants like me, definitely don't or right. don't think to initially. Right. So what's it like being a lifelong Brooklyner? Right running Brooklyn Magazine right. right now. So I would I would I would asterisk you and say that's not even a verb but I'm using it as one. That's all right. Brooklyn Knight. Brooklyn Knight. Brooklyn Knight, right? So yes. 
one of the things that growing up in this borough does, because I could have really take, I could have made the mistake in doing this show, I mean, in the show, <laughs> doing yeah. the magazine and going, well, because I'm from Brooklyn, I know. Mm -hmm. And I think anybody that's from a place knows that they do not know. Mm -hmm. So I'm from Bed-Stuy. There's two point, and I always make this a point when I talk about Brooklyn, there's 2.6 million people living here, mm -hmm. right? There's 52 neighborhoods. Brooklyn is not just one thing. And right. even me growing up in Bed-Stuy, like, I know the areas in Bed-Stuy that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I don't know everything about Bed-Stuy. So from that perspective, I'm not looking to tell Brooklyn what it is. Right. I'm looking to, for Brooklyn to allow me to document what the story is firsthand. Absolutely. Right? So everything is, it's, for me, it's been like we have this other um, content series we do called Styles and Profiles, mm -hmm. right? And Styles and Profiles is like this weekly interview series where we in interview like everyday Brooklynites about their style. Like, so these are not people who are in the fashion industry. These are people I see on the street or people I see at events. And I'm like, oh, yo, let's document you. And what is subtle about it, if you looked at the interviews as they're going up, is that we're not just documenting the style and the people, but we're documenting the people's neighborhoods. So when right. we go to uh, Bed-Stuy, you see the brownstones, but there's an another story we have coming out this week where we went to Diker Heights. Now, historically, if you black, you don't go to certain parts of Brooklyn, right? right? And Diker Heights is, was, is one of those places you do not typically want to go with the you know histories of like the use of Hawkins and all those things because that's right. also like a deep part of the borough. But also me being sort of the ambassador of Brooklyn is like if I feel like I can't go anywhere, then am, like am I really doing that work? Am I really putting myself in service? So we were in Diker Heights, me and my um, the photographer DP, and what was not interesting, but it was eye opening to see them embrace us under the under the auspices of like this is representing Brooklyn. This of is, the institution, yeah, right. of The magazine. So when I'm when I'm going out into the world, I'm not like I'm not just a, a, a ambassador of my neighborhood or the people right. I look like. I'm an ambassador of the borough at large. Absolutely. So I have to feel like first for me to be accepted in other places, I have to first feel like I could go to that place. Yeah. Now that's really what I've been doing, and I ain't going to lie. I was kind of nervous going out there. I bet but you. <laughs> yeah. When, when I was out there, people were like, they saw me. Oh, this dude is from Brooklyn Magazine. It changed it for a lot of people. It was and an so, entryway. Yeah. In order for you to even begin to have the conversation. Right. So what are some of the things that you feel like aren't being covered enough? Like what's being left unsaid? So I went to the uh, Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce 100 year anniversary mm -hmm. uh, gala. There was, and somebody being honored had said that Brooklyn as a borough has one of the oldest concentrate, the, the highest concentration of senior citizens. If you looked at Brooklyn Magazine, if you look at media in general, we do not really document over the age of 40. Mm. Right. So even like the narrative, like, you know, when I came in and I saw the 30 and the 30, there were so many emails I was getting from people like, well, what about 30 over 30? Mm -hmm. And we were trying to, we were saying like, oh, we do a Brooklyn 100. But what I did, what I, what I begin to see is like, how do we make sure we're telling all the nuances of the borough? So if, mm -hmm. you know, media in a lot of ways is essentially like, you know, focus more on a younger population. Right. Simply because right. the idea is like, this is who engages with it. But if mm -hmm. we're telling stories that are larger than the people we're just trying to tell them for, we also have to know that there are people older than 30 who, who are, are doing who are doing amazing, amazing things. things, and it is just people older than than thirty who have stories to tell. Absolutely, and those stories are and, and you talk about a landscape like Brooklyn that's always changing, because of the people who's changing and like the the, the land like you know the, from the, the high rise and all those things. Mm -hmm. It's really important to get a lot of the older perspective of the borough because right. it kind of keeps the culture intact. Even though things are changing, you have someone who's kind of telling you, well, this is what this used to be. And so when you're coming into right. a borough, you know, even though this is, you know, and what's funny about the, the, the whole notion of Brooklyn is that it's, a, it's like the idea of Paris. It and is. the idea is usually bigger than the reality. And so really what I'm trying to do is wrangle the, the, the idea to the reality of right. like, it's, just, it's, it's more stories. It's just more stories, and it's trying to tell as many stories as possible. And we so, need more stories. Yeah. And as a, we're both story lovers, so right. I know that like that's something that you're going to be interested in, I'm going to be interested in, something that we know a lot of people are going to be interested right. in are these oral histories of Brooklyn. And we're running out of time, but in the minute we have left, yeah. what are you excited about in the coming year in your role? So one of the things I'm most excited about is, um, one, I would definitely say, this, uh, we're, we're putting together like this 10 years of Northside. For mm -hmm. the people who don't know, the Northside Music Festival takes place every year at McCarran Park and around uh, the Bushwick, Williamsburg, Greenpoint area. Mm -hmm. And for 10 years, Northside has been doing that, um, Northside Media, which is the company that 
owns Brooklyn Magazine. Right. And like Northside Media, if people don't know, is where like Chance the Rapper first played his first like festival. Mm -hmm. um, we, the, uh, Solange played there. Um, there were so many people who had come through there, and there's so much culture that's in that festival, but also in Brooklyn, that we're in its, it's in its 10th year, and it's just to see, to be able to like, how do we make sure that more of the borough knows that this is going on in their backyard? Right. And so that's really what I'm most excited about from us kicking out. And like I said, just continuing to, to surprise people with the stories we tell. Right. Um, it's pretty much it. I can't wait. I'm All so right. excited for your tenure at Brooklyn Magazine yes. and as the editorial director of Northside Media. You know I'm watching and rooting for you yes, at yes. every moment. Likewise. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'm taking this cup. All right. <laughs>It's for good reason that there's a local organization devoted to messaging issues of racial and economic equality. Because sadly, in this country, race and economics are almost always intertwined. The median net worth of white families is estimated to be about 20 times higher than for black families. There are lots of reasons for this, including how blacks have historically been denied opportunities to accrue wealth. While this will take generations to undo, our next guests work to raise awareness of the issue through art and youth empowerment. They both come from Fury, or Families United for Racial and Economic Equality. We welcome Mo Beasley, the youth community organizer and author and playwright. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. And visual arts and poet Frantasia Fryer. Thanks for coming on 112 VK. Thank Fantasia. you for having me. Yeah. Can I? Thank you guys so much for being here. You both do work with the youth, this very, very, very important sector of people. They're our future. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the walkout today and what you saw in Brooklyn? Woo! You want to take that first? Let's go with you, Frantasia. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, the walkout today is, I feel like it's empowering and it's, um, it's, I don't know what to call it. I think that their hearts are in the right places. Mm -hmm. However, I don't know if actual change, that change that they're looking for can actually come from this walkout, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about um, the, the crisis and the shooting crisis in America, we need to talk about more than just gun control. I believe mental health, and which is something that we uh, tend to skip over a lot, mm -hmm. is also something that needs to be put on the table. So, you think um, there's a more holistic answer to this? It's right. not just guns, it's multiple things that exactly. need to be addressed. I totally understand that. And can you tell us really quickly, Mo, what do you guys do at Fury? Well, Fury as a whole advocates for right, housing rights for families of low income communities in mm -hmm. Brooklyn and citywide, but we're Brooklyn based. So we're, we advocate for housing rights, for economic rights, mm -hmm. for social justice rights, criminal justice rights. So we're it's about it's about it's about picking up that banner that Dr. King was was holding with the Poor People's Movement, which mm -hmm. got him shot. Yes, you know, and so we're Fury. And, and the mothers, the women of Fury, because Fury is a women's-based mm -hmm. organization um, that came out of the housing, New York City housing mm -hmm. developments here in Brooklyn, and out of necessity, out yes. of tragedy. And so Fury is always doing that work. Mm -hmm. um, but along with that, these mothers know that they had to pass this on. Right. And so that's where Fury's youth actually, comes in. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you actually run a poetry series, right? Yes, I do. I run um, an open mic series every month um, at um, the Brooklyn Commons Cafe. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just I wanted to give youth a safe place to come and state their poetry and also um, talk about these issues and important issues and get their real, raw ideas on it. And so we have real raw discussions at my open mic after, yeah. and um, oh yeah. So, so I'm guessing that they oh. get they get real real. So I have to tell. Can I tell this great story about the Go first ahead, one? Give so me we a we just launched in January, mm -hmm. uh, the Friday of the King holiday, mm -hmm. and so I set up. So I set up the first uh, theme and said we're gonna we're gonna celebrate the radical Dr. King. Mm -hmm. And so Frantasia came in the office and we're planning rehearsals and and um, promoting the show. And at some point she says, you know, Mo, I got to tell you, I really am not feeling this Dr. King. You know, this whole turning of the cheek non violent resistance say, I think Dr. King got some things wrong. Ooh. So, <laughs> so you want to pick it up? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so yes, um, so we were discussing the Radical King, and um, yeah, basically I do feel Dr. King got some things wrong, and while I do admire and respect his contribution, mm -hmm. I also, I look at the world today, and I think he should have promoted some different things. Like, um, one thing I think he should have promoted is instead of trying to integrate we should have fought for equal separate but the real equal you know mm. what i'm saying like it would have given black businesses today a huge push had we been spending money in our own communities in our own mm. businesses and while i know that's easier said than done because we have tried that and we've been knocked down before it should have been pushed a lot harder so i do think that dr king you know there are a few things that he could have done better and we we as a people might have been in a better financial place um, right. if he had done so. Well, we have the benefit mm. of hindsight. Right. We have the benefit of being able to look back on the world and see the way things have worked out and talk about what should have happened. Um, that's something that is going to happen even when we're gone. Right. <laughs> there will be people who look back and say, you know, I don't know, Ashley really said some wild stuff on 112BK, <laughs> and I don't know if I can get down with that. Right. And I'm going to be like, you're right, I was garbage. I was yeah. trash. No, like no, no, that, no. that you never, no, but like, you never know what's going to happen. Like can you tell mm. me really quickly, because yes. we only have so much time know, left right. um, mm -hmm. what's coming up that you guys are excited about Mo? Ooh, okay so Fantasia is a student at Mega Evers College mm -hmm. next week at Mega Evers College is Mega Evers College is the National Black Writers Conference mm -hmm. the 14th National Black Writers Conference so next week uh, it's a weekend long of, uh, series of events starting next Thursday on the 22nd mm -hmm. so and on the 22nd is Community Day and it's for youth all day long mm -hmm. so Furious Youth will be there um, workshops during the day um, and in the evening is a poetry cafe at the Dweck Center. Can you explain Furious Youth to me real quick? Yes, so Furious Youth is um, basically the children, the children who are carrying on the legacy of resistance and advocacy. Mm -hmm. The Furious Youth Arts House is how we use art art to spark the conversation, the deeper mm -hmm. conversation. So when you come to our open mics and you're a guest, please come. We come the f second Tuesday of every month. Mm -hmm. And after the performance, we have a conversation because every month is a theme. The right. first theme was the Radical King. The second one was um, Black History and, and Haitian Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and last month was the women's movement, women's history, hashtag me two times up. And Ms. Frantasia mm -hmm. has always has a radical, very unpopular opinion. She's taking people to their limits and yes. forcing them to think a little more and a little deeper. I love that, Frantasia, and I'm behind you with that 100%. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so Thank much for, for being us. here. Haiti and the Dominican Republic have always had a complicated relationship. Two nations, one island. And for both, an intimate connection to the U.S., with a large diaspora living here, and in particular in Brooklyn. Some of the fruits of these relationships are on display in Brick Gallery. It's a new art installation called Bordering the Imaginary, and we have two of the represented artists with us. Edouard Duval Carrier, thanks for joining us, and Sherazad Garcia. Welcome to 112BK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being here. Can you tell me, Edouard, how did you get involved with the Brick Gallery? Um, he, the curator, he, he, Abigail um, Dardashian, uh, came to visit me a couple of years ago, and so we started talking about the concept of this exhibit. And uh, I had a painting back then, I mean, that had just finished. I was trying to conceive of a new dollar bill, a new mm -hmm. paper money for the both side of the island, mm -hmm. and she thought that was very interesting. Um, the, the, as you were saying, the, the, we have a complicated history, mm -hmm. but at an economic level also we have a great dependency on one each other. Mm -hmm. So you know, like mm -hmm. I mean, why not create a new? D paper money for the for the whole island. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Can you tell me how did your cultural background influence the pieces that you're showing here? Um, well I think is key definitely. Um, the moment you live in a country with such a rich history mm -hmm. and so many layers of uh, uh, history, really, and w you know, when you are Caribbean, and that's what I'm talking to everybody before, you don't, you are not like only one race. You want mm -hmm. a mix. And we, we, I like to say that it's a sancocho. Sancocho is a stew that you put everything, and then it, it comes, and then yes. it comes something very special. Yes. So the moment you have that uh, history that make you feel that you belong to so many places, you know, um, it is easy for me 
to understand and even reconcile with the idea of a divided island. Mm -hmm. and understand that, you know, um, I love the differences between the two sides of the island, mm -hmm. and I also enjoy the common denominators. The common denominators, of which there are probably many. Mm -hmm. What does the theme bordering on the imaginary mean to you? Can you tell me that, Eduardo? We have 500 years of history, mm -hmm. of jo joint history, first established European establishment in the New World, mm -hmm. and the first big dramas in the New World, because 50, uh, probably about 20 years after the, 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 the establishment or the discovery yeah. of mm -hmm. the New World, I mean, there were already signs that, uh, I mean, horrors were happening. Mm -hmm. The Bartolome de las Casas, uh, which is this major uh, uh, personality. And Padre Montesinos. And Padre Montesinos. Uh, complained to the Spanish crown that, you know, like, I mean, when they had gotten there the first time with the first trip of Columbus, mm -hmm. I mean, had noticed that there were more than two, three million people, and by the time they came back, the population had dropped by 90, 90 percent. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, uh, suicides, you know, like mass exploitation, exactly. I mean, ex extermination programs, disease, disease, well. disease the contacts, also. yes, disease. So, uh, I mean, we've, we've had a very complicated <laughs> story, and it yeah. starts from there on. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the fact that the island is separated in two is like uh, through through a wedding. Knowing the Caribbean, uh, most likely. Most likely. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I mean, is that it? Dowry. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's just it's it's so complicated, but it's also so interesting. It's a rich history. I feel like in both places and in their interactions with each other, Shirzadeh, how can art influence a cultural understanding of that history? Well, you have to understand your history first, mm -hmm. and, and adding to what you were talking about, we are an island that always being on the verge of a revolution mm. since the beginning. Like you were saying, you know, this is the the the, the uh, priest than came under uh, the orders of the crown, and they come, and they are against the crown. Mm -hmm. So you can see the beginning of this uh, spirit of revolution. Yeah. Makes so much sense, because we are the roots of what we call America, mm -hmm. you know? So why it is important, what we do, why we have to do this kind of show well? If we artists are the voice of our times, Mm -hmm. And we have the responsibility of being agents of change. Mm -hmm. So we have to use the tools of the art and always being the most political of all right. to provoke thinking yes. without violence. Yes. Just let me go and take a look at this painting. Let me decode these images mm -hmm. and then people go to the library. Yes, I agree. I totally agree. I'm so excited for people to come see this show. I know it opens um, tonight, March 14th. March 14th is when it opens. I'm so excited for people to see what you guys are working on. Thank you so much for being here and talking about it, and may the conversation continue. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you for you. Us. Thank you for Thank the you. invitation. On tomorrow's show, a state assembly member will talk about plans to repair the BQE and how to spare the local neighborhoods as much as possible. And a local emergency room doctor will talk about what inspired him to work to minimize urban trauma and youth violence. We'll see you then.